Good evening. We had a beautiful day today, out riding bicycles. Thank you all for those that were at the Outreach uh, for Hope event. We had some, a lot of walkers and riders, and uh, it, was, it was a great time. So it raised a lot of money, pretty good for uh, Outreach for Hope. And you can read the signs out there to see all the things that they support. So thanks. It was good. And we have a prelude song, which is Gather Us In. place a new light is streaming now is the darkness vanished away see in this place your fears and your dreamings brought here to you in the light of this day gather us in the lost and forsaken gather us in the blind and the now and we shall awaken, we shall arise at the sound of our name. We are the young, our lives are a mystery. We are the old who yearn for your face. We have been sung throughout all of history, called to be light for the whole human race. Um, we had a wedding today, 1 o'clock, Becky Reed and Terry McGowan. So Tom is at the uh, reception to be able to give the meal blessing. and So we have a um, virtual pastor tonight. He's, we got him recorded, and we'll use that for the, for the message. Um, anybody else have anything exciting going on today, or do we ask that already? You, weren't, you guys were in the writing part. Just like riding. Okay. Well, let's let's get up and uh, welcome everybody.
All right, it's time to hit the hymnal, I think. Yeah, this is uh, one we used to do years ago, and now we're back to trying. You guys should pretty much know this one. All right, please stand, and we'll try God is Here. Blessed be God, the one who forms us, Jesus who bears the cross, the Spirit who makes our joy complete. Amen. Let us bow before God in humility, confessing our sin. Steadfast and faithful God, you have revealed the ways of justice, yet we fail to follow you. We are overwhelmed by the world's violence and suffering. We are afraid to risk what we have for the sake of others. For the harm we have caused, known and unknown, forgive us. For the ways we turn away from you and our neighbor, forgive us. Lead us back to you and set us on the right path. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Blessed, beloved in Christ, God's justice stretches beyond all understanding. God's compassion is beyond compare. In Jesus, God is always making a new way for us. In Christ, you are already and always forgiven. Amen. As we lead into the message, we will sing ancient words. Holy words, long be 
Friends, it's Saturday night evening service, <clears throat> and I am unfortunately unable to make it to be with you tonight <clears throat> because I am with the wedding party over at Ingleside Hotel, and they requested that I pray for the meal. Um, so it is my pleasure to be able to interact with people, get to know some folks. I understand the governor will be there as well. So it's a really good opportunity for for me to go deeper um, than just perform a wedding. Uh, as you can see, this first slide is holy ground. We're going to be talking about the scripture text today. Um, if I had children uh, before me, I would have had us take our shoes off and just kind of hallow the ground and recognize that this is a holy place where we gather for worship is is a sanctuary. It is set aside as holy ground where we gather and God does amazing things. So that's how we'll begin today. <clears throat> now, the major theme of this message is what is leadership? What is leadership? What is the true meaning of leadership? Well, the definition of leadership is to influence. It's to inspire and help others become their best selves, building their skills and achieving goals along the way. Sure, that sounds good, doesn't it? That's why I'm in life coaching, because I love to help people thrive and become their best selves. But the better question is this, who can lead, right? Who can be a leader? Perhaps almost anybody can lead. Almost anybody can influence or inspire and help others become their better selves. In fact, it doesn't really matter if you had a perfect life to prepare you to lead or if you've had a serious checkered past. I know some of you guys are nodding here, right? If God calls your name, just show up and God will take care of the rest. Did you hear that? Just show up and God will take care of the rest. Moses was a bad public speaker. Let's get to the point. His primary line is, let my people go. Now, how difficult is that? Okay especially when God delivers with 10 plagues, right? God gives you two tablets. If you can read, you can lead. Moses was a murderer, and you thought your sins were bad. Said and done, folks, God is looking for people who will just show up. So when God calls your name and says, do this, then like Nike, just do it. Our gospel reading comes from the 12th chapter of Mark, verses 26 to 27a. Short and sweet, right? Jesus refers to Moses as the next in line leader of God's people. Listen to Jesus' words. <clears throat> and as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses in the story about the bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is God, not of the dead, but of the living. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now we've got a really long reading from Exodus. So students, I need you all in with this text, okay? So here we go. Um, we're going to look up Exodus chapter 1, verse 8. Yeah, it goes through 2.10, and then we're going to go into chapter 3. So Exodus 1, 8. I know I'm not here right now. I'm not watching you open your Bible or not even moving towards it. But my encouragement to you is that you would grab that because of the length of the text, and you'll get more out of it. 
So uh, Exodus 1.8. Now, there's a new king, and what they call Pharaoh arose over Egypt, who did not know Jacob. Jacob. Sorry, Joseph. Sorry, Joseph. Are you kidding me? You know how important Joseph was? Our Hebrew, Joseph saved Egypt from famine, saved part of the world from famine, and this Pharaoh had no clue. And so this clueless Pharaoh, verse 9, said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. And so the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. And so confirmation students, for the next part, we hear about midwives. A midwife helps women during labor, delivery, and after the birth of their babies. So here we are at verse 15. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. Let's go midwives. Now that's some bold, disrupting, resistance leadership. Okay, verse 18. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt with well with the midwives and the people multiplied and became very strong and because the midwives feared god that means they revered god he gave them families then pharaoh commanded all his people every boy that is born to the hebrews you shall throw into the nile but you shall let every girl live now we're in chapter 2 verse 1 oh gee I got to make sure I switch slides. So, hey, there was a midwife slide. So, I sorry I missed that. I got to be on top of that. I don't have somebody else clicking. And you can see how that looks. Okay. Now we're at this scene. Now, a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. Her sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river, and she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying, and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from Hebrew women, from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, for I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses, because, she said, I drew him out of the water. Isn't that interesting? That's the name. That's what his name is defined, drew him out of the water. Moses was keeping flock. Now we're at chapter 3, verse 1. So if you want to stick along, okay, chapter 3, verse 1. Moses was keeping the flock as a father-in-law, Jethro, 
the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, how do we get there? Well, remember when Moses grew up, he saw the Hebrew slaves being harmed and he he, he killed one of the, um, the, the, the slave drivers and, um, and he ran away. So now we're at verse two. Um, in this scene, there the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. He probably said that a little more intensely than I'm saying it now. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place in which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians, to bring them up out of that land to do a good, to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Parasites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you, Moses, to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, God said, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, well, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever and this my title for all generations. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Who am I, God, that you should choose me to lead, Moses asked. I mean, think about it. Moses is a smelly shepherd living in solitude in the wilderness, tending to his father-in-law's sheep. He's far from Egypt in a nasty desert, doing grungy work and escaping his murder conviction from the place he grew up. And then God says, you the man. I need you, Moses. I need you now. I need you to lead my people, my oppressed people, out of the land of Egypt and into the promised land of milk and honey. I have no other plan but you. Just say yes, Lord. Yes to my will, to my way. Now, God speaks to Moses in a very strange way. But then, you know, God spoke to Abraham through three men over dinner and then to Jacob in a wrestling match. Hey, why not a burning bush? God can do anything God wants. So God chose a buckthorn bush, I like to say. And why not add some pyrotechnics while you're at it? Now, the question lies, how has God spoken to you? Maybe not audibly, but with a clear sign that led you to follow him, that led you to say, yes, step up and lead. Now, I, that's something I really want you to ponder this week, okay? Now, some of you have heard my call story, and you've heard it multiple times. Some of you have not, so I still continue to share. But it's a clear series of events 
that led me into pastoral ministry, just like Moses. I was kind of in a wilderness chasing sheep. And this really started the journey was when I was much younger, but I'm going to skip way ahead to the pivotal point. For me, the pivotal point came right after I completed a year traveling with this uh, ragtag muffin band uh, called Kindred. Again, we traveled in the U.S. and South America for a full year. And then afterwards, we were done. And I, I had done, I finished college. I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. Um, but I went up to the Boundary Waters for a week with some friends. I think that, that included Chris. And there we took a day of solitude to be alone with God. So I climbed up a hill with my Bible, and this is basically the view, right? So climbed up the hill with a Bible in hand and a guitar in another. And there on this holy ground in the wilderness area of lakes and trees, barely touched by humans, no motorboats in the promised land of Minnesota, it just didn't get any better than that. It was there that I surrendered my life to God. I had no real clue on what lies ahead next as a 23-year-old adult who needed to enter the workforce or do something, right? It was when I got home that my old teammate Kent, right here in the corner of the slide, um, had left me a note on the kitchen table and it said something like this, Tom, you got to check out Luther Seminary. I'm studying there to do my master's of divinity to become a pastor, but they have a great master's of degree program in youth and family ministry. And so literally the next day I showed up to seminary and attended this class. And the guy who was leading this youth ministry course was a Christian counselor of all things. And that's what I wanted to be since eighth grade. In fact, that's what I prepared for with psychology, social work, and religion. So I enthused enthusiastically, I know it's hard to imagine, I asked him after class to tell me more about his profession. And he could tell, right? He first asked me, well, Tom, are you an introvert or extrovert? Hello, right? He could tell that I was extroverted and loved being around people. And then he asked me this, can you see yourself in four walls day in, day out, listening to people's problems, but not being involved in their lives? I said, no way, that's not me. That was the turning point. And then I went through all the psychological and biblical knowledge testing to make sure that I was all there, if you know what I mean. If you, yeah. And then they sat me down and they said, Tom, based on your results, we are recommending that you strongly consider becoming a pastor. Whoa. Okay, you got to understand a little of my background. When I toured in this band, I could get up there and sing behind a guitar, but I would freak out doing any kind of a long message. So I avoided those messages. My greatest fear, yes, public speaking. Huh, sounds a little like Moses, you know, but you know the rest of the story. I got over it, huh? And I share this with you because like Moses or any other leader in the Bible, we often do not feel ready. We don't feel fully equipped or often fearful of what God may be asking us to do. But it's, it's not about us. It's about what God can do through you and me and Moses and any other person that God calls to step up and lead. The key thing is the partnership. This is the partnership, even what I would call companionship with God. God is with us. That's what we heard in the text. God accompanies us. It's God's Holy Spirit that works through us. God does most of the work. We just need to surrender to God's will and allow God to use our hands, our feet, our voice to represent him in the world. What may be God calling you to act on today that you may have been putting off or avoiding completely? You have another leader before you who did a Moses and Pastor Tom thing. Last year, about this time, I approached Steve Stretz to be our council president. Of course, he, he turned it down, made a few excuses, and I just let it sit. That's when the Holy Spirit did its work, tormenting his soul, waking him up at night. Well, maybe not all that, but, but God was working on Steve to say yes. It seemed like it came down to the last hour that Steve said yes. Of course, I said I'd accompany him, cheer him on, do this leadership thing together like Moses did with his brother Aaron, right? 
And as we know, Steve has been a great council president. Let's give him a hand. I don't know if he's here today or what, but hey, let's give him a hand. All right, thank you very much. That was that was pretty good. And certainly Steve's motto is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Watch out, Steve is preaching next weekend. Took a few years before that seed to take root and bloom too, right? So let's go back to Moses, okay? Moses, that smelly, fearful, stumbling sinner who God calls to lead his people out of Egypt. A pretty huge task. And just as his name means drawn out of the water of Nile, so he will draw God's people through the waters of the Red Sea to freedom. Moses' encounter with God on this holy ground happens 80 years after Moses had grown up at the palace. 80 years and he observed the cruel treatment of his people and fled to Midian after killing an Egyptian who was beating one of the slaves. We mentioned that before. And since Pharaoh had died, it is now possible for Moses to return to Egypt. We read that Israel groaned and cried for help. That is, they lamented their evil condition. We also read that God heard their groaning and remembered his promise to Abraham. The rest of the story, if you read through Exodus, will tell you how God changed their laments into the glorious hymn of praise found in Exodus 15. God is now raising up a leader in Moses. And so as we learn, God's first task is to convince Moses of the divine intention to respond to Israel's lament. Listen to how personal God gets with the many I statements in this passage. I've seen my people's affliction and heard their cry. I know their sufferings and have come down to deliver them and bring them up. It wasn't until God's last statement, I will send you to Pharaoh, that Moses began his own long series of objections to God's plan. But God deals with each objection, reassuring Moses and equipping him with the confidence he will need. To his objection of inadequacy, who am I? God responds, I will be with you. When Moses replied, well, then who are you? God responds, I am who I am. I will be whom I will be. Or I think God is actually saying, hey, that's for me to, you, to know and you to find out. No, maybe not. To the objection of incredulity, they will not believe that you have called me. God demonstrates three times an ability to affect miraculous change. Finally, Moses objects that he does not speak well, but instead of convincing, duh, me don't talk too pretty, the Revised Standard Version brilliantly demonstrates that this is not the case with its wonderfully eloquent translation, Oh my Lord, I am not eloquent. Either heretofore or since thou hast spoken to thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. That sounds like Shakespeare or something. Moses has just run out of excuses. And God responds that God is the one who created mouths and speech and can surely overcome this feeble excuse. Besides, Aaron can speak for Moses anyways. Said and done, it's not about Moses. It's about God's hand in Moses' life that gives him the confidence and the tools to lead his people out of Egypt. Similarly, it's not about you. It's about God's hand that can give you the confidence and tools to lead something that God is calling you to do. So trust God and do it. I'd like to teach you a simple song. Let me see if I can move my little uh, thingy here. Um, we've sung this before, some of you have, and it goes like this. Feel free to join in the first time or the second time. Yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes. I will trust you and obey when your spirit speaks to me with my whole heart I'll agree 
And my answer will be yes, Lord, yes. Let's try that. <clears throat> yes, Lord, yes. To your will and to your way, I'll say yes, Lord, yes. I will trust you and obey. When your spirit speaks to me, with my whole heart I'll agree. And my answer will be yes, Lord, yes. Well done. Let us pray. Lord God, <clears throat> you've called each of us to be your disciples, to live in such a way that would um, share you with the world. And often we hold back. Often we do not speak your name in public. Often we don't lead. In other words, we don't influence. We don't trust you. We don't trust your Holy Spirit to work in and through us. We fall short of what you desire of us. And so, Lord, we ask you to infuse in each of us a sense of confidence that you are with us and you are in us and you will give us the words to speak and the actions to do. We are simply to say yes, to do what you call us to do. So Lord, send us out as your people, bold like Moses, to declare your praises. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <laughs>
the offering. God, you break the bonds of injustice and let the op- oppressed go free. Receive these offerings in thanksgiving for all your works of merciful power and shape us as people of your justice and freedom. You we magnify and adore through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now if you join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Called together to follow Jesus, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Make your church one in purpose, proclaiming the message of the cross. Help us to work together across differences. Energize ecumenical partnerships, including the World Council of Churches and Lutheran World Federation. Merciful God, hear our prayer. We rejoice at the bounty of your creation. Fill the land and sea with your abundance and bless harvests in the Southern Hemisphere and fields waiting to be planted in the Northern Hemisphere. I think I've got an old prayer here. Equip farmers to till and keep the earth sustainably. Merciful God, hear our prayer. Break the rod of the oppressor in every nation. Dispel the shadow of death in places of war and persecution. Grant us leaders who see and fight against hunger homelessness, discrimination, and poverty. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Be a stronghold for those in trouble and a rock for all who are afraid. Lead communities to care for neighbors who need shelter, who are facing maltreatment or isolated and lonely. Strengthen and comfort those uh, who are experiencing devastating storms and flooding We think today of the um, people on the East Coast who are having torrential rainfalls. We also pray today for those listed on our screen. Don Teagues, Julius James, Steve L., Ann Grebe, Sarah Smeaton, Mark T., Jordan L., and Andrew, citizens of Ukraine, Eastern Europe, and for those serving in the military around the globe and those who have returned home. And we also pray to you, those in need who are in our hearts, either spoken or silently. 
Kathy, Grace, Merciful God, receive our prayer. Sustain the ministries of this congregation and all churches in this community. Nurture each congregation's unique witness to your presence. Foster mutual respect. Inspire cooperation in loving our neighbors. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We thank you for the blessings of all the parents and children We praise you for the faithful who have gone ahead of us. Help us to leave our nets and follow, and bring us with them to the fullness of your promise of eternal life. Merciful God, receive Receive our our prayer. prayer. We bring to you our needs and hopes, O God, trusting in your wisdom and power revealed in Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was to be betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after the supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We're going to do the prayer he taught us to say, but we're going to do it a little slower tonight. I think we rush through this and we don't really think about what we're saying here, so I'd like to do it slower. So it's, Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please come, the table is prepared. Take me as I am 
summon out what I shall be. Set your seal upon my heart and live in me. Take hold, shake me as I am. Summon out what I shall be. Set your seal upon my heart. Take, oh, take me as I am Summon out what I shall be Set your seal upon my heart And live in me The body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and keep you in God's grace. Do we have any ministry moments? No. Mary. Uh, this is the last weekend um, for to get your brick orders in. Um, we'll be sending in the order next week. And um, if you have someone you'd like to honor, I will take orders tonight. You've already taken it off the website. so. You said through yes through today, I so. Take a look at the uh, uh, All People's Church section, too. There's an opportunity for you to put together a hygiene bag or a Thanksgiving bag. Give you plenty of time to do that. Uh, there's a list there with the bags and everything. So if you want an opportunity over the next few weeks to gather some things together, um, that would be wonderful and it would be helpful for them. Thank you. Well, Mary did mention I took the bricks off the website, but I did add the Lutfus ticket reservations. And as soon as I put it up within... 12 hours, I already had reservations on there. So you can go on there and make your reservations and get your preferred time slot and tell other people about it also. So any other? We are called. Shine. 
the joy and the love of the Lord we are called to be light for the kingdom, to live in the freedom of the city of God. We are called to act with justice. We are called to love tenderly. We are called to serve one another. and brothers united in in love we are called to act in justice we are called to love tenderly we are called to serve one another Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.